For now, we're going with the four pillars as outlined, the six feet of social distancing and the fact that we cannot get all of our students into um, our typical classrooms um, with six feet of distance between them. Um, but again, part of the reason I'm sharing that we do plan to just share our, our general overview is that if some of you were, were joining this strictly to talk about um, an individual issue or, or hoping to continue the conversation in um, one of those subcommittees, uh, I just wanna make clear that we don't, we don't plan to uh, break out into subcommittees. It's not to say that we can't talk about safety, childcare, um, communications or, or, or those other things, but simply we're not going to um, devote uh, breakout time to them. So um, any questions in terms of what I shared about the county or, or the, uh, the plan for this meeting? So this ought to be a shorter meeting we don't expect it to take the two, the whole two hours, probably 15 minutes uh, for Ching Pei to walk through um, our revised thinking based upon all of your input and our ongoing conversations with um, the administrative team, and then um, getting your feedback, answering clarifying questions, and continuing to have you spot issues for us. We'd invite you to use the chat function so that we can save that chat and. Um, uh, look at it more closely tonight and tomorrow morning as we prepare for tomorrow night's board meeting. Questions or comments? Pam, if you could help me with this because my screen can only capture about 24 people. Um, yeah, nobody's raising their hand and I'll monitor the chat. Okay, so we'll attribute that to a late afternoon meeting. And uh, Ching Pei, uh, why don't you take uh, some time to go ahead and outline our current thinking and then folks can um, both make verbal comments and, 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 and give us feedback and ask us questions. I do want us to have a discussion, but as you know, a Zoom with 50 people can be tricky. And so feel free to use this, the chat function to flag issues for us, ask questions and um, you know, spot those issues or, or raise concerns um, with what you hear. Uh, so Ching Pei, to you. Uh, I've just asked Jerome to allow me to share my screen <laughs> so I can give you the slides. I have put the slides into the chat. Um, I will put them in here again for everyone in case anybody logged in after I put them in initially. So you can always open them and follow along. They are viewable to anyone with the link. Um, and they're not secret, so <laughs> they're not just for this group. All right, let's see. So hopefully my internet holds up today. If not, somebody just, probably Michael will tell me that I'm going wonky and I will turn my camera off. But what I wanted to do was just talk us briefly through our process and where we are and what we're thinking based off of all the feedback you've given us and all of the feedback we've gotten from internal stakeholders and from our administrative team as well. So um, just a word to the wise, these slides are far more text heavy than I normally have my presentations be. I just wanted to be able to capture everyone's thought and thinking and I wanted to make sure I didn't give you a bunch of graphics that didn't necessarily translate to our process. So we started the parent engagement back in June, um, seems like a, a lifetime ago, but it was really only two weeks ago with uh, four dates for the advisory committee. We've had a town hall on the 18th in the evening, as well as a full staff, all hands staff meeting on the afternoon of the 18th. We have looked at survey data and analyzed 1700 responses um, along with all of the various feedback from the town hall. We're in the process of creating the FAQ. I've got answers to most of the questions, but it's not yet formatted to be published, but we will put that up as soon as it's ready um, with all of the answers to the various questions. But we've, we've been reading everything copiously, even if we haven't been giving lengthy responses via email. I wanna remind everybody that we do have the four pillars from the county that we are following right now. As Michael said, these are these are our guidelines. These are what the County Office of Education is asking us to follow and think about. The idea is for us to be able to have efficient and effective contact tracing should there be some cases that arise. The idea behind these pillars is not to eliminate the COVID risk. Um, we're trying to strike the balance between being safe at school and being able to be present so that our kids can get the very, very necessary education. So. 
we've been talking about these pillars, the health and hygiene, the face coverings, physical distancing and limited gatherings. I just literally, as we were starting this meeting, got a text from the San Mateo County office, San Mateo County um, that said, we are now allowed 50 people in a gathering. So this change, this situation is ever changing and we're gonna, we're gonna just need to be adaptive and responsive. Um, first of what I thought I'd do is give you a very brief, this is by no means exhaustive uh, recap of the notes from each of the subgroups. So this is the, um, for the elementary subgroup, which was one that I was facilitating. We did have a lot of discussion last week about having a different model for TKK than the other grade levels based off of developmental need. Um, in all of our conversations, we understand that there are challenges for providing mainstreaming opportunities for our students and our SDCs. There is concern between staff and families alike of having too much time between in-person sessions because time away from school equals learning loss and a need for resetting routines. Um, we are well aware of the, the concerns for childcare. None of None of the options we offer are ideal. We, we get that children are generally in school five days a week and families, working families rely on that to be able to go and do their full-time jobs. This is a difficult situation and we're, we're just trying to make the best of a hard, hard situation. Um, and then I think overall, we have concerns as a group about what does independent study time look like for our students? Whether they're the younger ones who, uh, can't sustain time on tech, shouldn't necessarily be on tech, or the older ones who would rather be playing Minecraft or Roblox than logging in to do their science lessons. Um, for the secondary subgroup, there are, you know, similar concerns, right? What happens for the students during their off days? Are they home alone? Are they left to their own devices? Are there teachers who are going to be logging in with them? Um, is it too much for kids to get two and a half hours of instruction in a, in a giant block schedule and only see two teachers in a day? Um, there's the concern of the social learning, right? School isn't just about academics. A lot of school is about teaching kids how to work together and be collaborative and learn to be social beings. How do we keep kids engaged for such long times without being able to use our usual instructional tools and tricks that get kids mixing and moving, but require proximity if we're supposed to maintain six feet of distance between students in the classroom. And then there was discussion too about, can we use flipped learning strategies to help combat the learning loss? So like I said, not an exhaustive listing, but a few of the things that kept coming up through the notes uh, that were mentioned multiple times. We had a childcare subgroup that was facilitated by Genevieve. Um, we do have on-site child care providers who've been partnering with us and we understand that we're not setting up an easy situation for them. We want to make sure we are all following the county guidelines. We want to make sure we support our families the best that we can, but with the social distancing rules and the stable cohorts, there is going to be limited capacity. Um, we need our families to understand that even with on-site child care, there is the potential that's that you know, two or three cohorts from the school day, even though they're separated during the school day, may be mixed together in the after-school care or on the off-campus days. Um, we do have providers who are looking to provide after-school support for families, as well as support on the days when the kids are supposed to be off-campus doing independent study. Um, and then some of our site, pro some of our providers are also working on off-site locations where kids can be. Um, gathered during their off-campus days so that there's a safe place for kids not only to be while the parents are working full-time, but also potentially having an adult monitor that they're doing their independent work as expected. There's a safety subgroup with Chris Marchetti and Craig Goldman, and you know there are lots of things for us to consider. And as we continue to plan and as continue to kind of march forward with the changing situation, we are going to keep lots of things in mind, including what do the routines look like? Every site's gonna be a little bit different in terms of drop off and pick up based off of your physical layout of your school plant. There's going to need to be teaching at every single level of how to wash hands properly. How do I put away my own goods? How do I make sure that when I leave the classroom, I've taken everything of mine with me? I know some of our kids tend to leave things in their desks for days and weeks on end. I know when I was a teacher and it was desk clean out days, sometimes you would find old snacks and old food. We're going to try and teach our kids not to do that this coming year. Um, we have to think out, think through what does recess look like? If we are assigning certain groups of 
classes certain times of the day to be on the playground, certain kind of quadrants within the field to play. How do we mark that off? Are we using paint for the fields like AYSO does? Are we using cones with yardsticks and caution tape that say, it says, here's your, I don't know, 100 square feet for your class. Um, we have to think about the, the cleaning supplies and the routines for our custodial staff and the protective equipment for our custodial staff as they're sanitizing and disinfecting so that they're not inhaling toxic chemicals. Um, we have to think about, do we have a supply enough supply of emergency disposable masks for kids who come to school who have forgotten them or kids whose masks get soiled or wet or teachers masks who end up getting soiled during the day because now I've been talking and my person my respiration has made it damp and I need something different. Um, these are all things that we need to keep in mind and we are going to keep in mind as we continue planning. For the distance learning subgroup, there was a lot of discussion of what went well, what didn't go well, what can we do better in the fall? Because we we all know that there is a chance that we will have to go back into a shelter in place or a full distance learning, um, either by pod or by school or potentially by entire district. And we also know that some of our providers, in order to limit cross pollination, will be doing instruction through remote learning for the for the bulk of the school year. So we've heard loud and clear that families want a consistent district-wide platform with consistent tools and, and good communication. We know that we need to create a schedule that allows for regular interaction with teachers. Um, we know that with kids coming back and it being so different, there's going to need to be social emotional learning built into the day, as well as trauma-informed practices, because we don't know what our kids are going through right now. Um, some of our kids don't have the safest home environments, and that's true in every school district. And I think we're grateful in our district that the numbers are fewer, but it is a reality for our students. And I think the other piece that we heard loud and clear from the distance learning group is it really helps when the school grade level is aligned, right? The teachers together work and determine who's got what strengths and interests and maybe split up the work so that we can support the teacher and the student. Um, and it's not just more, more, more for expectations on the teaching staff. For communications, one of the key points was we've really got to figure out how do we backwards plan from August 19th. That's our, our plan to start of the school year, right? So we're talking about staff and community communications, keeping everyone up to date on the changes as they come. Um, making sure that we manage expectations, right? School is going to open, but school is going to look different. And while kids are probably excited to come back, some students probably need a little bit of coaching and help from the parents to understand that we're not gonna be able to run onto campus and give our best friend a giant bear hug because we've missed them for the past five months. We are going to still need to maintain some physical distance. We're going to need to wear masks whenever in public. Um, where you know, the group suggested possibly using videos to communicate rather than email all the time so that there is a little bit more of a personal connection, but also this narrative of feeling, feeling more connected. And then really the key is we've got to make sure our information is coming at a consistent clip and what we give is clear and concise. So with all of that, we've put together, I think, what our version is right now. Um, understanding that one, it needs to go to the board for discussion. Two, you, uh, I see lots of chats popping up right now. There are think, questions and other concerns that we'll, we'll take into consideration and revise yet again before going to the board tomorrow night, but also that there's a negotiations process. And so we are going to make a recommendation. I've got three recommendations I'm gonna share with you. Plus I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some alternative out of the box thinking, um, just so you guys know what, where we are. So after much discussion, we are proposing that for TKK, we follow the, the A, B schedule that is split by time of day. So the A group would come every morning and the B group would come after lunch. Um, this way, the students who are the youngest would be on campus every single day, seeing their teacher every single day for a little bit less time than they would if we were at school full time. And there are some obvious pros to this, right? The daily interaction with the students and the teachers is really important. The daily support for our youngest learners is key. The other piece I think that is a really nice benefit is that there's consistent pacing, right? What I teach in the morning, I'm going to teach in the afternoon, which means that if at 3 p.m. when I go home, suddenly the county health officer says, by the way, tomorrow you're going full distance learning, 
my kids are on the same pace and I can switch and all of my kids are generally together. They're, they aren't a week apart or five days apart. Um, and this also relies least heavily upon independent learning. So if I'm going to be at school from, I don't know, two and a half hours in the morning and then I go home and have lunch, there, I, I, there isn't the same need to say, oh, by the way, do these five puzzles and read these three books and do this drawing page before coming back to school tomorrow. It could very well be, here are two activities and then go play in your backyard and get the physical exercise that we're not getting at school. And then I'm gonna see you again in the morning. There's a consistent daily pattern. So kids get the routine. The obvious cons are it's really, this is gonna be tricky because the rest of our students in first through eighth grade will be on an A, B schedule by day. So kinder has traditionally, TK and kinder have traditionally been on a different schedule than the rest of our students, which is why we think it, it, it makes sense to make this recommendation. Um, it is not ideal and we recognize that. We do recognize that this poses childcare needs. Being on campus a half a day is really tricky in terms of drop off and pick up. And we really do need to work out our routines and our sanitizing expectations for our custodial staff and, and ensuring we have proper chemicals and machines and whatnot to take care of the sanitizing. For grades one through eight, this is all grades one through eight because we wanna make sure our, the rest of the district is aligned. We're proposing an A, B model that has you on consistent days. Um, so group A attends every Monday, Thursday, Group B attends every Tuesday, Friday, and then the Wednesdays are split evenly. So if I have a happen to have a day, a week where Monday is a holiday, then group A will attend Tuesday, Wednesday, and group B would attend Thursday, Friday. Um, we want to make sure that kids end up having 90 days of school. So it is possible that I would go to school Tuesday, Wednesday of this week, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of the following week. So I don't want to say every other Wednesday, just because we need to account for 90 days equally. Um, you see, I've listed the pros and the cons. I think one of the things that really stands out from the different conversation was how much learning loss, how much time in between for students from seeing their teacher to turning in their work. And we keep coming back to this balance of what is instructionally going to be the best practice versus what makes the most sense logistically for families and childcare. So, while an every other day model would be really nice, having Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then Tuesday, Thursday, the next week, seems to me like a logistical nightmare. And I'm lucky enough to have a husband who works from home and can watch the kids, and it still seems like a nightmare. So what we're trying to do is provide some consistency for families, some predictability, so you know which days you need to plan for childcare and or work from home um, and or share childcare with, with your neighbor. But this way, we feel like it works for teachers and students alike. If I see you on Monday and we work on four or five different subjects in elementary school and you have the follow-up homework and, and reading and maybe an independent journal practice the next day, not only is it easier to assign one day or two days worth of work, it's a little bit more motivating to the student to know that if I go home on Tuesday, I'm gonna see my teacher on Wednesday and I have to get it done versus oh, here's my packet on Friday and I'm not gonna see you for the entire school week and maybe I'm gonna forget about it before I come back to you again one week later. So I think this is the kind of shortest time in between sessions as practical. Um, again, this allows con some consistent pacing between the groups so that should we have to trans transition to full distance learning, kids are on pace with one another and there isn't a huge shift. Um, and then kind of the benefit is because I have an entire group in the classroom during the day, I then have the entire afternoon and evening to sanitize the classroom space before the next group comes. So now I know you guys probably all have a bunch of questions. There are some, some differences depending on the grade level, even though the recommendation for grades one through eight is to follow the same A, B schedule, what's gonna happen on the days looks just slightly different. So this slide talks to you about the first through fifth grade specifics. On the days where kids are home, we're calling them independent study and specials days. Um, your, your students will be off campus. The students will have work to complete that their teacher would have assigned them, but they won't have their classroom teacher checking in with them to say, hey, how's it going? What questions do you have? It's also not the end of the world because if I don't understand how to do something today, I'm gonna see my teacher tomorrow. And I can ask my teacher as soon as I come back and we can build in review and, and questioning with the teachers then. Teachers in grades three through 
teachers, students in grades three through five will also be able to get their music instruction from the music specialists on these ISS days, these independent study and specials days. Students in grades four, five will have their science instruction delivered on these ISS days by their science specialists. So they're not going to be left to just kind of hang out by themselves and figure out all of the independent work. They will have some teacher guided activities and instruction, just not from their general ed classroom teacher. And then of course the students who receive additional support, whether it's from the reading center or the speech pathologist or the learning center teacher, or even a counselor, because we're gonna to continue to have counseling services available to students. These would happen remotely on those off days as well. And what I'd like to do is say that we should explore utilizing our parent volunteers to provide engagement for particularly our first and second graders who don't have the, the, the standard specials. Um, can we maybe look at doing art in action remotely? Because what we can do is on Monday, send students home with your art materials. And on Tuesday, the parent volunteer could potentially log in and say, let's do the art lesson. You have all the materials from the teacher. So this way there is some community building and still the full spectrum of our curriculum. There are definitely kind of volunteer issues that we'd have to look through, but just an idea of how we can support our kids um, in the off days. For students at Nesbitt in grades six through eight, they also have an independent study specials day on their off day, right? Kids will be off campus at home or at their cousin's house or you know, sharing, sharing childcare wherever you are. Um, students will have work to complete. At Nesbitt, the students will receive their science instruction from their science specialist, Misty Wood, on these off these off-campus days, and the students at Sandpiper will receive their PE instruction remotely from Mr. Van Lahr. And this is, I mean, the programs are slightly different and the, the school sites have decided to use their staff allocation a little bit differently. Um, all students would get PE and science, just some of them are delivered in class by the general ed teacher versus the specialist. Um, students in part who choose to participate in music at Nesbitt and Sandpiper in the middle school will still continue to receive that instruction from our music specialists on these off days. And then the same thing, anybody who receives support from a reading teacher or a counselor or a speech therapist would also receive their remote services through telehealth and or um, live online sessions with their teacher. And finally, um, for grades six through eight at Ralston, we are calling the off day uh, an independent study slash distance learning day. Um, students will be off campus. Students will have homework and projects, I'm sure, to complete independently from the, their on day where they're getting two core subject areas and one elective. Um, students at Ralston notoriously have a lot of homework. So the day away from campus will be the opportunity for kids to get their work done. Um, and they will also be getting their remote PE instruction from their PE teachers from Ralston. And of course, students with additional special support will continue to receive their services outside during these, these off days as well. What we're trying to do is maintain their in-person time to have the maximum time with their classroom teacher rather than doing pull-out sessions while, you know, in the five hours that they're on campus when they're already on the campus, such a limited amount of time. The way the schedule works is a student would attend three courses each quarter. So quarters one and three would be the same three courses and quarters two and four would be the same two courses. So we would get, let's say English language arts and science in quarters one and three with an elective and then quarters two and four would be math and social studies and an elective. Um, these three models, these, these two models really fit what already exists within our collective bargaining agreements so they're kind of the traditional model that we think will provide the path of least resistance. However, we have several alternative models that have been brought up that have great ways of meeting the needs of kids um, from the high flex model that we discussed at Monday session, Jorge was able to describe it a little to um, maybe saying we're fully distant, but we're gonna split the kids into groups. And so uh, my 30 kids are gonna be in groups of 10 and I'm gonna see all of them every day, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend an hour with 10, give them independent work time. Then I'll spend another hour with the other, the second 10 and then give them independent work time and then spend an hour with the third 10. So everybody gets an hour with the teacher, but it's spread out and there's a balance of virtual work and independent work. Um, 
Or there's yet another model where we think about 25% occupancy, which is totally out of the box. And we can pursue these kind of in parallel, but we just want to make sure that the, the committee understands that these out of the box different ways of thinking do require negotiating with our teachers union. And so while we'll bring it up and we'll pursue it, we just don't want anybody to get um, false hope that we'll be able to implement something so quickly. So that is in a nutshell, I think the compilation of the work you've accomplished um, and the guidance you've given us to be able to go to the board tomorrow to present some models. Uh, questions, comments, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm opening up the chat right now just to make sure that any of the feedback you've already put in there, I can, I can make sure to add to our presentation before we go to the board tomorrow or make adjustments as necessary. You are basically my dry run. Michelle? I don't want to take up this group's time, but um, I, I'd like that kindergarten be able to talk to you guys more, um, perhaps not just through email, but uh, through a conference call or a Zoom call or something, just to um, talk more about the the structure of that week with, with regards to our, to our big concern about using precious class time with half the class using it for, it, we spend endless hours doing assessments in September. Then uh, we do interventions with small groups. And any of that done within the school day is gonna take away from other kids' uh, school experience and education. So I don't wanna go into it right now, but we, we would like more conversation. So let's see uh, how the board goes and um, we'll work out all of those kind of logistics and specifics once we have the finalized model. But the but I'd I'd say we're we're very much open to that. Um, we can talk with you on an advisory basis if you guys want to give us advice on what's educationally viable. We just have to make sure that we're not um, choosing to talk with you instead of BRSFA. If that makes clear, if you know you've got your representative group and um, we're open for you all to give us advice, but we just want to make sure we're. Um, respecting um, your collective bargaining group. But I think uh, conversation is, is better than just exchanging emails and Google Docs. Yep, for sure. Uh, Pam, since you can see more of the whole group than Ching Pei or I can, um, why don't you facilitate um, having people uh, speak? Okay, so uh, Jeff Jackson has raised his hand. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the summary. That was really helpful. Uh, my question for you is when you go to the board with those recommendations for each of the different groups, you also showed the last slide with the alternative uh, proposals. Will those be presented to the board and, and how does the process work? The board looks at those proposals and just votes or how does it work? We're, we're, we're setting it up as a discussion with the board. So we're gonna say, hey, listen, here are the conventional, what I call the conventional solutions or, or, or approaches that currently comply with our contract with the teachers, what's called the collective bargaining agreement. Now, if we've come up with some creative options that don't comply with that, we wanna feel the board out to say, what do you think of these? Do you want us to pursue those with the teachers uh, bargaining group and if so, we'll see how that goes. And then we'll have to, at some point, uh, make a decision. But, but basically, we're going to say to the board, do you prefer the conventional approach? Do you prefer the alternative approach? And then um, if they say the alternative, we'll try that with um, the, the teacher's uh, uh, collective bargaining group. And depending on how that goes, we can either pursue that successfully or, or uh, go back to the conventional. So we're trying not to rule out the unconventional options. Um, and so it's a little bit of a delicate balancing act given the procedural, I don't know, the, the, given the constraints of wanting to engage the community, wanting to consult the board, but then also needing to make sure that we honor our agreements with our employees. Okay, and is, that, is, there, a is there a deadline? 
a deadline for what? For picking, I mean, when, is, when do you have to decide what the schedule is going to be? Oh, you know what? I, I um, you know, uh, change can be tough. So for me, I see these uh, unconventional options as uh, possibilities, but considerably less likely. So I don't know that, um, I mean, we'll, we'll keep folks informed of how negotiations go. And if it looks like the unconventional options are viable, we would certainly wanna keep everyone informed. But I think we wanna plan on the conventional options, both for parent planning and for staff planning, but we can explore those unconventional ones. But I think they're, they're less likely based upon my um, experience with our, um, with our uh, employee groups. I don't, I mean, so I, I, if, to, be, to be perfectly candid, I don't know that there's a high likelihood of success with the unconventional ones. And so I don't know that there'll be a big surprise curveball to everybody in early August that we're, we're going some radically different direction, if that's what you're concerned about. No, I'm just trying to figure out scheduling. So, you know, if we, if it looks like it's one of the conventional, when, when will we know for sure so we can start arranging childcare type things? We'll try to keep you informed as, as negotiations progress. And, um, you know, I would expect, uh, you know, once we take a break, maybe for the next um, week or two um, and let the new administration administrative team take over, I would expect some weekly updates, just letting people know um, if there's been any shift in context at the county level, you know, I talked about that a little bit at the outset of this meeting. Um, have there been any um, shifts in thinking um, based upon, you know, some of the conversations that Michelle was proposing or uh, with our uh, BRSFA um, employee groups and just keep, keep, keep uh, our constituents informed. But um, if I were to articulate my expectations, um, I, would, I would have folks planning on those conventional options um, and, and we'll keep you informed if any of that, if any of that shifts. Ching Pei, do you have anything to add? Okay. Pam? Um, Diane Sexton. Hi, Diane. Hi, I just uh, agree with Michelle. We probably wanna take this offline. Uh, regarding the TKK plan, but just to reiterate, we were really thinking of a um, more of a eight to ten, and then eleven fifteen to one fifteen schedule for the AM PM, but not going much uh, longer into the day. So that's okay. just just a clarification point. Right, and then you hand that off to an administrator, and they always try to. <laughs> Add some more time. And so I want to make sure that um, uh, we, like Michelle said, find an opportunity yeah. to meet the, the, the interests of uh, the district, the parents, the staff in a way that serves kids best. So I agree that some additional conversation might be a good idea. And we can get the board's uh, thoughts on this. And we can also um, have those conversations um, with BRSFA as well. And we have had um, Abe Rosas is totally um, updated with with everything that uh, kindergarten has been doing, and he's a member. Terrific. Of that that's that's yeah. that's uh, we appreciate that, so that um, there aren't any issues with uh, different groups of teachers. The more you all are together, the better all the better off both sides are. Pam. April Northrup. Hi. Um, so I, I would, I, um, I missed the beginning part. I apologize. Um, so if this was covered in the beginning, I apologize again. Um, so um, I, I would be curious to ask the uh, child care providers um, how they see uh, the alternating days in the week schedule, uh, coordinating with their ability to provide child care. And um, I also just wanted to suggest um, that given all the Monday holidays and other people have suggested this in the chat that we really consider going to Monday as the variable day um, so that you know at least then 
parents will know Monday is funky. Sometimes the kids are off. Sometimes they're in school. Sometimes our grandparent is coming to take the, you know, visit them. Um, and they can plan for that over the weekend instead of it coming in the middle of the week on a Wednesday. Um, I addressed that um, a little bit in the chat. Uh, we do need to um, uh, pursue that with um, our employee groups. Uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic about, about that than I am about the um, unconventional approaches uh, to schooling. Um, and so I think we can definitely pursue it. Um, and we, um, you know, we'll just have to see where that goes. Um, but you had the majority of your, your question was around childcare. So I, I'd, I'd um, invite any of the childcare providers who'd like to speak to uh, indicate uh, their interest uh, um, to Pam and, and Pam, you can um, facilitate. Okay, Karen had her hand up. Hey, um, I can tell you what footsteps is hope. Well, I can say planning, but every plan is changing every five minutes. Um, we are hoping to provide uh, care for families when they need it. So um, on site for the TK and kindergartners, um, and then uh, on site for the children who will be on site, and off site full day care. Um, it probably won't be seven to six, but maybe eight to five, something like that. And um, do this distance learning or what the learning process with the kids as best to our ability. Um, I am talking to lots of different places to find space. So far, nothing's for sure, but it's looking good. So um, uh, we're working at, but we would also need the schools to provide lots, maybe extra classrooms during the, the school day because the class, the groups have to be so much smaller unless that changes. Anyone else want to comment, a uh, child care provider? I'll try a comment for um, Brevard City Parks and Rec, which is um, based at the community center. Um, we are planning to provide on-site childcare. Um, we are looking for a location for off-site right now, so that is in the work, and we'll keep everyone updated. Thank you, Adila, and thank you, Karen, both. We appreciate it. We realize that it's a uh, very challenging circumstances for child care providers because in addition to all the uncertainty we're facing, you have to then deal with the additional uncertainty of what we're doing programmatically. So we appreciate your flexibility and, and patience with us. Right now, and hopefully a deal we're, we're a little more flexible than the Redwood City School District. Uh, so you get a little <laughs> bit freer hand uh, with us. Well, yes, we did. The <laughs> Reverend City School District did give us classrooms, though. So, okay. All right. Yeah. So, you can so. Uh, use our flexibility against them and our, <laughs> their facilities against us. That sounds, yeah. that sounds like a good, a good way to go. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we recognize that um, in order for you all to successfully um, meet the demand, you're going to need more space, right? If the kids are going to be spaced out. Um, or you're going to have smaller groups than you normally would. So we're going to have to strike that balance between um, sharing our space, you know, perhaps um, uh, science classrooms, music classrooms, um, uh, the, you know, trying to be as creative as possible while, um, you know, because we want to also support, uh, um, you know, our classroom teachers as well with regard to them having all their stuff where they left it the, the, the day before. So, to, you know, we'll, we'll keep working on it. Um, Pam? Uh, Simmer Baines? Thanks, Pam. Um, I just had a question in terms of if we do decide to go or we have to go full distance, is there going to be, is that a plan that's gonna be negotiated as well amongst teachers, BRSFA, and the district to kind of hold some accountability with students and parents, whereas this time we kind of just did it because there was no choice. So is that also still being discussed though, just as a, a backup? Yeah, we, we, we've been advised by the county um, to be ready for uh, full distance learning at any time. So we will need to develop a game plan for that with BRSFA 
we will want to provide a little more structure uh, this time around than we did this spring. Um, you know, whether it be with grades, um, with the, you know platforms that people are using, um, scheduling, whatever, um, so that uh, families know what to expect, teachers um, know what the people to the left and right of them are doing, and um, also. Uh, so that students uh, feel a little bit more engaged and accountable, absolutely. So yes, um, even if we are aiming at in-person schooling, um, we've been advised uh, to be ready for um, a distance learning um, at any time. Okay, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Oh, sorry, that was... I have one, I know this is further down the road and it doesn't necessarily have to do with uh, daycare. Is that okay if I ask it? Yeah, right yeah, yeah. Okay. This is um, open agenda. Talk okay, um, further down the road uh, with report cards, are we looking at possibly having to make some adjustment to the report cards or does that look like our report card that we have right now will fit what we're doing now in, in schools? For me, I haven't gotten that far. Um, well, you won't be here, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's an easy cop out for me, right? Um, but I do know that Ching Pei has been, you know, uh, works a lot more intimately with the with the um, report card committee, with the report card itself. Uh, Ching Pei, why don't you take this one? Yeah. So our report card committee was supposed to get off the ground and running with kind of reimagining grading with a training that's supposed to be happening this week. Clearly that hasn't happened. I think what we have in our report cards right now are the standards for the grade level. Um, what we will be looking, need to be looking at is what's considered bench meeting benchmark and meeting grade level expectations. And do we need to look at how do we accelerate learning so that we don't fall behind. But I don't think we would be altering the report card. I think our expectation is still to teach to our grade level standards and to make sure our kids are making progress. And one of the tasks the teacher leader group will be working on this summer is scoping and sequencing. So we know, you know, in social studies, there's no way we're going to get to every unit, but we want to make sure we hit up consistent units in every single grade level. We want to make sure we're not taking out key units and key skills and provide, you know, matriculating kids to the next grade without having given them the critical thinking practice that they need or, or taking out all of the diversity in the curriculum just because it was easy and fast. We, we adopted a curriculum that is very diverse. And so we're going to be looking at that to help guide teachers with what science is gonna look like next year. We're not gonna get through the whole curriculum and that's okay because we can still identify the skills that the kids absolutely need that are foundational that build year upon year. So that as we come back to normal, all the third graders kind of had the same foundation instead of, oh, shit, these third graders got these four, the, the last three modules, but then these third graders got the first three modules and now we don't really know how to support them in fourth grade. Um, so there will be a little bit of work from the teachers, teacher leaders on that. And, and guidance on what does what does that look like? But I don't anticipate major changes to the report card. Okay, and and also um, when we all get back, we're going to start at a place where we don't even know where we're going to start. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be uh, a lot more evaluating and assessing informally and formally of the kids. So that's going to alter where we see these kids in terms of doing that first trimester. Absolutely. You know? so we're, we're 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 looking at the assessment calendar and following kind of. The, the timeline for one PSS, I don't think it's going to change, but the benchmarking of what's considered at grade level and where, how far behind are we? Are we behind? Um, where, where do kids end up falling? And then I think once we have that data, then we can start making plans for how do we close the gap? How do we get to where we need to be at the end of the year? Do we adjust where we're going at the end of the year? Yeah. Where people are coming in. So rather than the word behind, can we just call it the new normal? Yeah, nobody's going to be behind. We <laughs> globally are in the same spot right okay uh, yeah okay. i think carolyn yeah. for me the thinking has to be about we want to go just as deep um as we did before in the curriculum but we may have to be um we may have to prioritize and and um cover uh, uh a narrower uh breadth of content if that makes sense yeah yeah and so for me it's about 
prioritizing what we're going to cover, but we still want to go after uh, depth. We still want to go after critical sure. thinking skills and so on and so forth. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question for Jing Pei. Jing Pei, you um, in the Ralston model where there's they're going to have three courses in person um, each day that they go and it's two two core and one elective. Are those the 90 minute blocks that you were talking about before? OK, that's what I thought. And then that that slide said quarter one and three would be the same and two and four would be the same. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, you may have a semester one elective and a semester two elective that's different. Different. Okay. So, you know, we're not going to make you do pottery over and over and over. Yeah, again. I don't think my daughter would want part of pottery <laughs> four times. <laughs> She'll be happy to know that then. <laughs> Thank you. But she'd get really good at pottery, you know, by she the would. time Mother's Day rolls around, she'll be acing it. I'd have some great <laughs> pots. <laughs> um, Thank you. Uh, Pam. Uh, Gloria Wu. I have a question about students who need special education evaluation and also those students whose triannuals are due. Will the specialist or the school psychologist be able to do those assessments and testings in person? Or will the assessments be done via Zoom? Lara, I saw you pop on. <laughs> I thought you might want me to take this. Uh, we're working uh, that out right now. Uh, I have, because our psychologists don't work in the summer, I have a contractor who's uh, trying out a protocol with parents uh, who allow us to uh, try it out on their students. They're going to come to the district office. Uh, we're using the boardroom. We're opening all the windows. There will be masks, there will be shields, there's a plexiglass divider, and uh, the, the psychologi psychologist is, um, she used to work in our district, so she's, she's very familiar in, uh, with, with our students, and uh, she's going to see what happens and how it goes. So um, if we can get that to work, then uh, we absolutely would be doing it in person. The, the psych assessments and the ed specialists probably also the, the online assessment is not gonna be great. Um, and some of the psych assessments they will not be able to do unless they get close to the students. So we're, we're still working that part out. Um, the SLPs have been researching online assessments and there's quite a bit that they can do online. And it's, um, it's research based, it's blessed by the publishers. Uh, Pearson is our main testing publisher. They said it's totally fine norm wise. So we may actually be able to get through the assessments uh, pretty, pretty well, better than I expected. And uh, we're, we're taking a bite out of them this summer. So we'll get through a few. Okay. Thank you. Laura. And well. Gloria, another thing we're working on is mainstreaming for um, SDC students and also how best to provide those um, support services for uh, things like speech and folks in learning center. Um, and uh, in the resource programs um, at Ralston. So that's still on our radar. We're still working it through. You know, if the county health officer gives us a little bit of flexi flexibility, which we expect, um, we, we do expect to be able to continue um, with mainstreaming. And um, we're still working on um, what the implications are for learning center and resource. That's great. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Pam? Uh, Michelle Green. I have two um, questions. One, Tony Thurman, the state superintendent, came out with uh, the state's plan for reopening schools and suggestions, um, recommendations, and uh, he his just suggested op, you know options of plans. And I know why you're smiling, Michael. We're four days a week, um, and I, I I don't know too much what the other districts around us are doing. I know Los Gatos. Um, I have a friend there and they're doing a, a Monday, Tuesday and a Thursday. So they're doing four days anyway. Um, that's one question, what we know about um, the state, superintendent, state superintendent's um, ideas, rec plan, recommendations. The other question is, um, I'm sure everybody just wants to know that we'll be able to have the schools cleaned and all that. And um, I know Craig's, I'm sure he's been working hard on that. But from a teacher's per perspective, you know, we're trying to wrap our head around what it, so many things, but the cleaning part of it, like what, what will that look like? I mean, how will they be able to really sanitize a whole room 
Um, so again, I'm not asking for reassurance about the level of it, just how. And, and will the, um, possibly, I know you have to negotiate, but would the, would two, so, so, um, would both custodians possibly be on campus at kind of the same time or what? If, so it well, just- if, if, you know, it's, we understand with kindergarten classrooms, um, many of them have their bathrooms. So that's a cleaning and sanitizing for the classroom itself. Um, you know, we would probably, um, you know, expect to clean and sanitize uh, um, desks and, and, and chairs, but I don't know about cleaning and sanitizing the whole room, right? If kids are, you know, all over the place uh, playing with books and blocks and, and, you know, what they, what I normally see them doing in your classroom, Michelle, that's going to be a heavy lift. And I don't know that we're going to be able to even clean and sanitize uh, three or four classrooms um, midday uh, to pull off your AM PM plan if we're if we're cleaning and sanitizing the entire room. Now, if you know we just build in some some um, routines where a student gets to their their room and they uh, clean off their desk and you know and that's I'm talking K eight where you know we have um, a soap dispenser at every you know, desk and kids can clean their desk at the beginning and end of using their, um, their desk. And then we have sanit sanitizing happening in addition to that. You know, that is something that, that we can explore. But, you know, obviously, um, you know, we do have the constraints um, with how much staff we can hire. So, you know, it's going to be trade-offs and, um, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not angling to have the kids clean for us, but you know, it, there is uh, an element of practicality here just in terms of what the routines that we're building in and um, what, what's reasonable to expect. And so if, if we're talking about a top to bottom cleaning and sanitizing of a classroom, that might be um, a uh, obstacle to us being able to do morning afternoon. And, uh, and then with regard to the, the four days a week, I smiled with about Tony Thurman just because, um, you know, he's uh, as much a politician as a superintendent. Um, and so, you know, uh, we're, we're uh, open to uh, four days uh, a week and, and, and um, Wednesdays being a, a prep day for, you had said, assessments and, and um, interventions and things like that. But, you know, we also have parents who, who have already been told that their child used to go to school for 180 days and now it's 90. And if we take away Wednesday, it's going to be even fewer. And, um, you know, so there is, an, there is some pressure from the community for us to try to get their children to school 90 days instead of, instead of 180. But there's also an interest in giving teachers adequate prep time, the ability to do those assessments, the ability to do intervention and having a quality program. So it's just a matter of trade-offs and, and for us trying to find that, um, you know, the right balance for our community, for our, for our staff, for our board, um, for our employee groups. I don't know if that was, did I address your questions, Michelle? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, as much as we can. Uh, th yeah, the short answer is it's messy. Terry's had her hand up. <laughs> Hey, Terry. Hi, Michael. Um, okay, so I have a few questions. Um, when we're talking about all this, I haven't heard anything about paraprofessionals. Not, not one. Mm -hmm. uh, also, um, not that I'm a parent right now, thankfully, of little children, but if my kid were to come in and sit in the chair that the kid who doesn't clean very well I'd, I'd be stressing very much, wondering mm -hmm. chair last if the kids are cleaning. Um, and ultimately I, I just see that the need for more custodians. Okay. And we just had our budget cut by 10%, you know, and so it's a matter of, you know, um, does that mean we have to go every other day? That's, you know, I'm not, I wanna be really clear. I, um, uh, we can, yeah. So that's, that's something that we, 
Um, expect to offer uh, clean facilities and safe facilities for everybody, students and staff alike. Um, and you know that may then push us in certain directions for which of these models that we we use. I mean, the every other day model is it gives that custodian more time. Uh, certainly, back to paraprofessionals. Um, it's going to depend on the situation. So we are expecting in say preschool and some of the SDC classrooms, there needing to be um, a higher level of um, equipment and um, uh, protective equipment uh, for all staff, uh, paraeducator and teacher alike, uh, because of those students' challenges with social distancing. And, you know, we're touching our face and we're touching other people and we're, you know, running for the door and those kinds of things. And so that's very much on our mind. And um, then, you know, so we are, you know, I can defer to Laura, but we're very much thinking about our paraeducators. Thank you. But you said you uh, more questions, or do you, Laura? Do you want to speak to the paraeducator question? Um, certainly. I mean, we have ordered uh, equipment for the paraeducators who work more closely uh, with our students: uh, face shields, extra gloves, and um, and they have their own masks. And we also have ordered masks. Uh, they they will have time built into their uh, day for cleaning. There's enough staff so that they're not going to be so busy with the students that they don't have time to stop and pause and wash their hands and clean off a desk. They, they will be able to do that. Uh, we are going to be, in terms of the special day classes, we're going to be careful with um, I don't know, cross-pollinating the paraeducators so that they are exposed to as, as few students as possible. Uh, we'll provide extra training. I've, I've allow, um, given them access, all of them, to the um, integrated pest management training. So if they want to do a higher level of, of sanitizing, they're, um, they are permitted to do that. Uh, but they're required to do the training if they want that. Um, and then... What else? Uh, just, you know, I, Terry, I mean, you know me, I love the paraeducators. We cannot run the program without them. So any concerns they have, please tell them to come to me. I want to address them and I want to hear them. Anything else, Terry? Thank no, thank you very much. Um, Michael, do you want to have maybe Craig talk about cleaning? Some people in comments are talking about kids cleaning their chairs and their desks, and um, sure. Maybe I uh, in my screen, I don't see Craig. He's here. He's on the I'm next here. screen. Uh, Craig, are you available to uh, talk about cleaning? I haven't been keeping up with the chat. And sure. um, um, so I think if we're talking about midday switches, uh, you know, we have to figure out what we're trying to achieve. And what we're trying, I think what we're trying to achieve is that we're trying to kill the germs. And so, um, you know, we do want some level of cleaning. We want the desk cleared off. We want to make sure that uh, any, any frequently touched surfaces is available. But, uh, you know, we're probably less concerned about cleaning on the switch than we are about sanitizing. The sanitizing can happen fairly rapidly with a pump and wand system where the custodians basically run the room, hit every desktop and chair and other, you know, hard surfaces and uh, frequently touched surfaces. So um, I think that's where we get a bang for our buck. Um, I do think that there is some benefit in children learning that they need to, well, in, in assisting, I should say, in, in cleaning up their own spaces. So if we get some benefit of some cleaning solution, which is not toxic, to children uh, to, to clean their the desktop, uh, to clean their chair, um, to assist the custodians and the sanitization process. I think that's time well spent. Um, but I think what we're really looking at is killing the germs that might be there and that's happening with sanitizing um, and making sure that our custodians have access to that. And um, so, uh, beyond that, I think one of the things that we do need to be aware of is reducing the number of hard surfaces that are available. So I do think we 
need to rethink, particularly in the younger classrooms, about access to um, uh, manipulatives uh, that will not be able to be sanitized and cleaned, even on a daily basis. Um, and I think that's, when we look at the state guidelines, they really talk about putting those items away so that, that you know, we're not cleaning 30, we're not doing 30 desks, we're doing whatever, 12 or 13 or 15, and we're not doing lots of little items, we're doing broad, um, large surfaces. Yeah, Craig, thank you. That was kind of what I was um, after, if there was a way to spray and it evaporates fairly quickly and, and those other things. So thanks, that was helpful. There are no other hands raised. Well, cool. then really fast, I asked in the chat, Corey, um, are we moving out half the desks or would we have 30 desks and every kid would have their own desk? So then it wouldn't, it would require a different level of cleaning because they wouldn't be sharing a desk necessarily. Um, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and answer. I think what we're looking at is, is reducing the number of desks because we want to reduce the cleaning surfaces. Um, in some cases, we're going to redeploy desks. I'll use an example, uh, kindergarten TKs, which might have rectangular or circular desks. Uh, those are probably not going to be viable for distance learning. So those will have to either be, well, they'll have to be relocated either, you know, somewhere in the classroom or, or to another space within the school facility. Um, you know, we're going to want single desks. In the case of double desks, um, it may be that we end up choosing to, uh, to leave those, but with an understanding that students are only sitting at on one side. Um, but of course, that the entire surface would be would be sanitized. I think you know it's just going to largely depend on what what we have available. We don't have enough single desks. I don't think to cover particularly all of our primary classrooms just by repurposing them from the uh, from the four fives. Um, thanks, Craig. Uh, Corey, did that address your question? All right. Um, Ching Pei, uh, Sean raised a concern in the chat about, um, you know, making sure that we keep after this distance learning um, program that we will likely have to use at some, for some point of time at some school or maybe district wide um, uh, it, during the 2020 21 school year. Um, he suggests a task force or a committee. What are your thoughts in terms of um, working with our teachers uh, to make sure that we have um, sort of our best thinking at the table in terms of setting up structure, expectation, platforms, tools, then the training for those things, et cetera, et cetera? It's, it's a big lift for sure. Um, one of the things we sent out earlier this week was the summer professional development options for everyone. We have platforms. We have tools that the district has already purchased. We have consistent tools that everybody can access. And um, based off of the feedback that the teachers gave me, I am also getting quotes and, and looking into some additional tools to support learning. Um, I don't think the, the difficulty we had this year was due to lack of materials and resources. I think it was due to inconsistencies um, and, and maybe too much choice, right? I think professional latitude is really important, but there was too much to choose from, which made it feel like people were coming from all over the place. And I think as we move forward, one of the things that I hope we can, and this is this is really dependent upon how we work through our negotiations. I do, I do think we have the capacity on, on site within our teams to pull the great practices and look at the tools that worked really well. We have support for our teachers this summer for those who are signing up to do all of the Google Suite to learn classroom really well, um, along with some ISTE -E offered PD um, that, that teachers are allowed to choose from. If, basically giving them carte blanche to say, this is what I'm interested in learning. This is, this is a tech tool that I want to, that I want to learn about. And, and I'm funding that for them. Thanks to school forces, PD funds. Um, so I think 
I think we need to work at this from a, nego from a negotiation standpoint, but in terms of the technical expertise within our staff, we have great models to call upon and, and, and maybe replicate. Um, and then Craig, uh, Simmer Baines had a comment with regard to, you know, the, um, if a lot of kids keep materials um, in their desks. And so just making sure we talk with the site level folks with regard to what's stored in the desks. If we're not going to, if kids are now sharing desks, what are the implications not only for cleaning and sanitization, but then what are the implications for the storage of the stuff? Um, and is that in a backpack someplace? Is that in a cubby someplace? Um, or is it easier just to keep it in those desks and, and um, have the students? Yeah, and I think that, you know, and again, we're, we need to learn from our, our middle school uh, colleagues. Uh, students come and go. They don't store anything within the classroom. Um, obviously, with younger children, that may be a little more difficult to manage, but uh, I do think we can find ways where there's not storage within the desks themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, understood. Uh, okay. So, um, uh, anyway, I um, will uh, see, Pam, if there are any more questions or comments. Um, I want to let everybody know that um, we take your input seriously. Um, if you think of anything, if you spot any issues, if you have concerns with what you hear at tomorrow night's board meeting, um, you can send us uh, your questions and comments. Um, feedback at brssd.org, that email is going to Pam Hopkins. It's going to both me and the incoming superintendent, uh, Dan DeGuara. It goes to the head of HR both the outgoing head of HR, uh, Genevieve, and the incoming one. And so um, we will make sure that those comments then get forwarded on to Ching Pei. Um, but just know that they're not going to get lost in translation um, in the shift from, um, from me to Dan. Um, and that uh, we want the conversation to, to be ongoing. We want the communication to be ongoing. And we expect to give the community, um, both staff and parents, updates over the course of the uh, summer so that people aren't told one thing in June and surprised with something different in August. We realized that would be uh, poor form. Um, Michael, there's a, question, a couple questions uh, that have come up in the chat about when uh, people will know about class assignments and can it be earlier so that they can make plans or arrangements with other parents in the class for childcare groups knowing if they're a or b and that kind of a thing yeah yeah um we're right now uh having our our tech department go through our um class lists our our enrollment and trying to figure out that that a and b and so uh the a a group and b group and um when we get feedback from the board tomorrow night we ought to have a rough sense going into next week um, which uh, schedule we plan to use, um, you know, whether it's that Monday, Thursday, uh, Tuesday, Friday approach and, and so on and so forth, we can um, then figure out the A and B group, um, Ching Pei, you and Genevieve can look at the calendar because remember, it, assuming we're on the, um, the current calendar where Wednesday's the minimum day, um, you know, what would that look like um, for which days are A days, which days are B days. So ideally we could, um, you know, in the next week or two, uh, get a rough cut out to everyone with regard to at least whether they're A or B um, based on um, family last name and that kind of thing, or I don't want to overpromise. I, I think it's good. I mean, we're going to have a rough cut, but we also then need to factor in people's choices of who's coming back to school versus who who's choosing distance learning at which point gotcha. we would probably need to do another. I, I, I mean, we'd have a rough cut, but I think if we shared it this early, it's likely to change. We had said we would send lists the first week of August. And I think that's a realistic aim where okay. you get your assignment and it won't change. Right. 
Right. Okay. Better to better to take a little bit more time and give people the accurate assignment than to have it be wrong for ten percent. Okay. Uh, Pam, you said there are a couple questions. Um, um, Terry has her has had her hand up for a while. Okay, and, and I see Michelle's hand physically up too. Yes. Speaking as a um, an office person, um, we have to remember we're going to need to retrain all of our parents, not just for the drop off and the pickup, but for all the forgotten items for the students. There. <laughs> The late lunch yeah. and all those things? Yes, lunches, homework, inhalers, everything that comes out, their lunch money for their early day, everything that comes into the office. Yep. We'll get the bank tube that sucks it through the, <laughs> the, the vacuum like yeah. uh, we used to have uh, 30 years ago. Um, but no, we, in all seriousness, we appreciate you flagging that, yes. Um, the biggest change, the biggest challenge here will be human behavior, right? We are going to have to learn new habits, new routines. Uh, Narina Carpenter. Uh, this is, uh, thank you. Just a follow up to the conversation about professional development. Is there a thought? Um, it just came to me when you're going through the negotiations that you think about the timing of the professional development days. I mean, personally, I love some professional development and I'm taking advantage of it, but I think a lot of us are just like, I cannot even think about this now. Um, is there a thought to have those training days before we go back to school? I mean, I just think there's going to be a lot that we need to consistently have trained across the different staff levels. And, you know, if, if we can start with a consistent platform, you know, for lower grades and middle grades and upper grades that um, parents are, you know, aware of, I, I still think there's a gap there of teachers feeling comfortable and maybe they just don't even know where to start. They've just got a shell of a system and they're not using it. Yeah. To its That's a good suggestion. This year, uh, the staff development days in September and not October. So we did try to move it up from previous years, but that's still a long shot from before school starts. So that's a good suggestion and something we can certainly explore. Thank you. Uh, Michelle Green. And Adila raised her hand too. Oh. Okay. Just physically, oh. not, not via the little function thing. Uh, Michael, Michelle? Yeah, Michael and Ching Pei, um, I was one of the people who put that question in the chat. Could could parents, would it be helpful if parents got their classes uh, assign, assignment um, earlier in the summer so they could, uh, you know, kind of maybe arrange for a few families to share some daycare ideas? I, would, I wasn't thinking that they would find out if they were an A or B, though. Um, to me, as from elementary, this wouldn't be the case with middle school probably, but in elementary, uh, and I know this is a pandemic and so it's not always gonna be the same as it always is, but um, teachers put group, group their um, students together for the next year with really a lot of, uh, a lot of forethought um, with, regarding um, heterogeneous, of course. Yeah. But the, what, and we'll try not to take a total wrecking ball to that. Um, yeah, what, what, well, it would if you did um, told them if they're going to be A or B. So we'd have to completely redo everything. But why not tell them ahead of time, this is the group you're in. They probably wouldn't even know the teacher. That doesn't matter. But they'd know um, there'd be a way for them to know the kids in that class. And then that we'd have time. They'd have some time to figure out some out of the box thinking for daycare. And then towards the end of the summer, that's when we can divide up into A's and B's. And for elementary uh, teachers and principal, we just have to make sure we knew where the siblings were. They yeah. could, parents could give input that, oh, you know, we have three families, we're in the same class and we figured out a way to, to share childcare together. Could we be in the same A group? So there'd be yeah. more flexibility and, and we could be more nimble. Right, so telling everybody that they have Michelle Green as a teacher, I mean, those well, 25, those 25, okay. yeah, the challenge there is um, we want, half your students in the A group and half your students in the B group. And then what about those other students that wanted distance learning full time? And so uh, there's a lot more complications this time around. Um, and so I think to Ching Pei's point, we wanna measure twice and cut once, so to speak, and give everybody accurate information in August rather than 
um, fumbling around and, and um, sharing out information quickly, but perhaps having to change it for some percentage of the group. So we'll, we'll uh, do our best. Uh, we agree that the sooner, the sooner people can get information, staff and, and families alike, uh, the better. Um, Adila? I think Chin Pei just answered it in the chat, but okay. for the first couple of weeks of school or a minimal number of weeks of school, are you allowing volunteers or anything else on campus or just the teachers and the students? For the county health guidance right now, no, nobody but staff and students are allowed on campus. And until that changes, we will not be allowing volunteers on campus either. We'll so follow will, the guidelines for this. Okay, understand that part. So that will be a challenge for us for TK and kindergartners for childcare because we pick them up from class. T Talisha, is that correct? Yes, the staff. Will yeah, we don't we don't see your staff as volunteers. So okay. so you're good there. Okay. Yeah. Thank no, you. oftentimes we have a lot of parents coming on to campus that might um, help teach um, mm -hmm. art or um, music um, or less music, more art, um, but some different enrichment programs, um, or even just help small groups in mm -hmm. in the lower grades, especially. So. Um, Unfortunately, we don't get that extra help. Okay. Karen and Carolyn. Yes, when considering the groups, it's also important which families need, need before and after school care. Um, because if we have 40 families who need it at, um, in the A group and 10 that need it in the B group, it's gonna be hard for us to do it as providers. So just letting the childcare providers uh, or the parents let the school know their childcare needs, especially for the TK and kindergarten, because if we're gonna um, be there for before and after school for them, which I'm assuming we plan to be on site, um, we, if they're all in the morning and then are in the afternoon, it's gonna cause problems for us to be able to stay open. So we need to be able to work with, the, um, with each of the principals to try to make that work. I understand there's lots of variables, but yeah. we wanna be one of them. We'll do, our, we'll do our best. The, 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 yes. Our primary uh, uh, operating principles are going to be number one, households together. Number yes. two, take a look at it from a, um, students with disabilities, making sure that we're setting them up for the support services, the support services they need with our placements. And then, um, yes, if we can, we will uh, try to coordinate with, with child care providers. Thank I you. saw uh, Carolyn Marinaro's name, uh, hand up. Hi, thanks, Michael. Um, I'd like to refer back to what Michelle was saying about how teachers take so much time to carefully divide our classes and balance the classes um, for the pre for the following year. Um, you know, when you see a class list, you see names, but when we go through the, the process of putting these kids in classes, we know who has, you know, which kid has a parent volunteer, which kid is a behavior issue, which kid is really helpful. And each of our 25 kids is placed with purpose and intention. Yep. And we understand that you have done heterogeneous, idea. thoughtful, heterogeneous groups. Right. So I'd like to strongly suggest that when changes are being made to our class list in terms of um, A and B schedule, that teachers are involved in that because by, by separating out kids, you could end up with one group with all the behavior issues and one group with all of the high, high academic kids. Yep. So I'd like to promote that we, you know, somehow have the teachers involved in that process. Yeah. And, and that's tricky because a lot of teachers, at least, I mean, I, this was true for me as a, as a teacher myself or, or even a principal, you know, you turn off your, your email, you turn off your computer for a while and you try to just take a break and recharge the battery. Um, but we understand that um, these are unusual circumstances and it may be worth the teacher's while to uh, uh, stay in touch with us. Certainly we don't expect them to work for free uh, but um, yes, we agree that uh, trying to um, keep an eye on that uh, is worthwhile for everybody, students, yeah, and, I, students and teachers both. Yeah, I think that if teachers realize that by putting in an hour or maybe not even that much time could, could um, make a huge difference in the balance of their A and B groups, then, you know, why not take that time to be involved? But I totally, I understand what you're hearing. There's not everybody feels the same way I do. So yeah. thank you. Allegra Newman. 
Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if a teacher needs to be out for any reason at all, if they're sick or have a meeting or whatever, what's the current thought on the plan for that classroom? Is I, I'm not sure about if substitutes are allowed or if the class is just going to need to be home that day. Yeah, we're, we're nervous about having to just do distance learning. And when I say that, we're, we're, we're going to follow the county guidelines. I mean, every single district in the county is going to have the same problem. Um, our challenge is, can Michael Milliken substitute in third grade at Cipriani today and fourth grade at Fox tomorrow and seventh grade at, at Ralston on Wednesday? And so um, we're nervous about whether the extent to which um, teachers can come in and out of those cohorts of students. If we're, if we're trying really hard to keep our students constant, but then switching the teachers all over the place, um, it's a little, um, it, it undermines that effort a little bit. So um, we're gonna keep an open line of communication with the county and see what they'll let us do. And, but we realize that if in-person instruction is good on the teachers on day, you know, hopefully we can provide it um, on the, in, the, in the event that they're out. Uh, Ching Pei, is that your understanding? Yeah, we're going to keep in touch with the county in terms of the regulations for substitutes. I can tell you we won't be pulling teachers for trainings or anything during during the week. Um, one, because of the, the current setup of, of the classrooms, but also two, just to save save some funds. Um, part of our 10 percent cut is not pulling teachers for professional development during their workday. So at least that should minimize absences. Um, of course, when a teacher is sick, they're still sick and they need to take the time and recuperate. So to be determined, but um, we will uh, do our best to continue the educational program um, and we'll uh, see what the county's telling us um, in August. Carrie Amsler. Hi. Uh I've been thinking a little bit around um, something I heard about on the radio with the Caltrain supervisor. And he was talking about the role of, of enforcement versus compliance. And I'm building off of something Terry said around parent education and my role as, as site-based leader, how will I lead? Will I lead to build compliance to wear face masks, compliance to wash hair, rather than enforcing, like I'm a security guard, having to go around and be like, your mask is off, your mask is off, you know? So I'm trying to think, this is very, this is a lot for me to think of, but I'm trying to think of how I can build a culture of compliance on the campus, that, that we are all in this together as a community for the health and safety of our students, rather than I'm the enforcer walking around campus um, trying to like pin people down to follow the rules. So I think about that when I think about um, Nikki and Veronica, the amazing people at my front desk, how, how, what is their role? How do they build that culture and how do I support them in that process? And how can all of the members of this advisory committee help us build that culture um, as we move forward? Yeah, and, and, and for the educators in the, in the group here, you know, we, we have a lot of experience with PBIS, positive behavior intervention supports. So how do we um, make clear to students what the expectations are? How do we make clear to parents what we're working on the kids on? You know, we all have a lot of ex experience as, as parents and educators both uh, shaping student behavior, you know, whether it's running at school and we compliment them for walking and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to have to be shifting those skills to now safety related and, and health related uh, practices and protocols. For sure. And uh, Sean, and it looks like made a point, uh, Ching Pei and, and, and the, to the teachers in the group with regard to student groupings, one option is just to push forward this year's student groupings. Um, you know, that has its pros and cons. Um, so we hear you and we'll, we'll uh, um, you know, consider it. Uh, April Northrup. Thank you. Um, I had a question about um, Ralston with the number of classes and also PE. Um, so my son goes to Ralston 
and uh, he has been uh, not very active, to say the least, during shelter in place. Um, so with the, uh, with the new uh, county health officer order today that said gatherings of up to 50 people are allowed, um, I would be wondering if PE could be one of the six classes um, that would be taught in person so that kids could have the benefit of uh, doing athletic activities in person. And that uh, either you only have six classes and therefore you have one elective, I believe is how it works out. Or if you are gonna have still seven classes that one elective become a distance learning elective. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. I mean, PE is manda mandatory uh, for students for, for a reason, right? The state, uh, uh, and the community thinks it's important. Um, we do too. For right now, our, cha our challenge was um, having the numbers work out because we have, um, I, I forget the number, if it's five or six um, teacher, uh, five, thanks, Ching Pei. I think we have five PE teachers for um, 1,130 students, 1,150 students. And so they're averaging, you know, um, we do have some students with on independent PE who um, put in a lot of hours on on more competitive sports, but you know we're still looking at um, you know 220 students per teacher um, versus a normal teacher would have somewhere between 150 and 180, and so that um, for us having those groups of students stay together and and have the teachers shift through it was a little bit tricky because the numbers were completely different in PE. So we can certainly look at it, especially if the um, health orders become more flexible over the next couple months, uh, we can keep revisiting this. Um, I know we were pretty consistent, PE is distance learning, PE is distance learning, but we really are open to um, trying to work it in um, and, and we share the interest of, of you and um, you know, the, the state legislature about the importance of PE, for sure. Um, Diane Sexton. Oh, hi, this is an um, uh, answer to Carrie. I was listening to Governor Como today talk from New York talking about how he led New York to lower their COVID cases. And he said he was not the enforcer but he gave the people the facts and the science. And so it would seem that the leadership will come from our superintendent. You know, it will be coming from our site administrators and it will be coming from the county health department, of course, and it will be coming from the teachers also modeling, but it would be maybe nice to get some facts and science delivered via the telephone messaging system that we have throughout the district. Um, on a daily basis. So an update from the superintendent or an update from the principal. Okay, here's the science, here, is, here are the facts, here are the cases in Belmont, these are the cases in San Mateo. So far, everything's a go, we're all, you know, distance learn, we're still in class, remember to wear your mask, remember to wash your hands. And it might be just as simple as a daily message going out via our, uh, our messaging system we already have that goes out through the telephone system. So uh, it was a very inspirational message that he gave this morning on the news. And so it's, I think, being, uh, you can get it on the, on the TV somewhere. I think there's an interview with him tonight or later. So worthwhile I, seeing. Agreed. And as educators, that's our orientation, right? We'd rather, we'd rather persuade people than, um, play bad cop for sure. Um, uh, uh, so thanks, Diane. There's no additional questions. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, Pam, if you can make sure that you copy um, the chat and share it with um, our cabinet team, uh, yep. including the incoming folks, that'd be great. Sure. And um, I just wanna thank everybody on this committee um, you know, we've, you know, as I check, uh, the participant number, you know, it's, uh, hour eight of our meeting. 
if you look at you know four meetings of two hours and we've got 55 participants. So I just wanna thank you for donating your time to our effort. I want you to know that we take your advice, uh, your concerns, your questions seriously, and we're gonna try our best to use it to inform the plans that we share with the board tomorrow night. But more importantly, um, once we get their feedback, you know, our plans going forward um, from here to August and uh, the discussions that we have with BRSFA, um, the, you know, and the, the um, way in which we interpret the county guidance. So um, I just wanna say thank you. Um, we're uh, deeply appreciative. I see that Suwerna Bopali is here, board president. Um, Suwerna, do you wanna share anything just in terms of, I do know that we have had a number of board members listening in, but on behalf of the board, do you wanna share anything? No, I, I think you said it well, Michael. I, I just wanna thank everyone as well. Um, all of the, the survey data, the um, staff meeting you had, the um, advisory committee breakouts and, and these meetings we've had all together, um, as well as just the, the numerous emails and feedback that we've, we've gotten have really been helpful. And I, I feel that we are in a place where we're coalescing around um, certain models and it's been helpful to get everyone's feedback to be able to eliminate the models that don't seem to be um, viable from a safety perspective or from um, just a practicality perspective. So we really appreciate the feedback and it's been um, invaluable. And, and if there are any other board members who wanna say anything, but just wanna thank everybody. We re really appreciate your feedback. Uh, terrific. Thank you, Suwerna. I, um, I went to her specifically as our board president. So, um, and also, again, thanks to Dan DeGuara for joining us. Dan, we look forward to uh, welcoming you to the family officially uh, July 1. And um, any words you want to share? Uh, no, my pleasure. Uh, it is important for us all to come together as a community to plan ahead. And I uh, just know that I've, I've also been reading the email and I've uh, been an active participant, so I look forward to continuing the work um, and know that uh, we will get through this together and, and plan accordingly so that our kids are safe, our community is safe, and, and we're able to, to meet our instructional goals too. So thank you. Awesome. Okay. Pam, thanks for facilitating. Uh, please relay our thanks to Jerome as well. Pei, thanks for your hard work in preparing uh, the materials. And again, thanks to the group and uh, the you know, the conversation and dialogue will continue. Uh, much appreciated. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, everybody.